Over the last 30 years, there have been thousands of reported sightings of unidentified flying objects over the British Isles. You think I'm bloody daft, but this is a UFO. In the summer of 2008, reports of flying saucers and other crafts were capturing the headlines again. Over the years, numerous eyewitnesses, including military personnel, police officers and experienced airline pilots have testified to seeing strange lights in the sky and other mysterious phenomena. 12 o'clock. Very bright yellow. It's the brightest light I've ever seen in my life. Many of these UFO sightings remain unexplained to this day. But what or who were they? Could they really be evidence of extraterrestrial life? Yeah, it's a strange, small red light. Weird. It's coming this way. It is definitely coming this way. It was just something out of uh, a science fiction film. It was totally unbelievable. Tonight, we hear firsthand from those who witnessed them and examine the truth behind some of Britain's most celebrated UFO sightings. In April 2007, the airspace above the Channel Island of Alderney played host to one of the more unusual British UFO sightings. I thought initially it was an aeroplane, but clearly nothing like I'd ever seen before. I saw a single lozenge-shaped light below us. I didn't see any outline to the shape because the light was so bright. I was in the front looking at it through binoculars. Pretty scary. Yeah, the second one appears to be beyond the first from where I am. This is probably the best witness that I've interviewed in 30 years. If it was designed by an engineer, that man, I'd like to shake him by the hand because it was a fantastic piece of equipment. <laughs> On April the 23rd, 2007, Captain Ray Bowyer was making a routine passenger flight from the south coast to the Channel Islands. He'd flown the same route for almost 10 years. We loaded the passengers normally, ordinary day, little wind, nice smooth conditions, very good visibility, you can see very well. Normal day, yeah, into the cruise, 4,000 feet, no problems. The 80-mile journey to Alderney takes just 45 minutes. Ten miles from France, it's the most northerly of the Channel Islands. Ray Bowyer was expecting it to be a routine flight. Just a little bit of paperwork, keeping a good lookout for other aircraft, and that's when I saw the first signs of the sighting on that day. It was about 10 miles south of the Isle of Wight. I saw basically what was a brilliant yellow lamp, brilliant yellow light ahead. Sometimes these are reflections from the ground. And in fact, I could see even from that distance that Guernsey was immediately behind that light. So I presumed at the very first sight that it was a reflection of the sun on a greenhouse. Looked at it for a moment, and then expected it not to be there. Next time I looked back at it, this didn't go away. It wasn't a couple of moments. It was a minute and then a couple of minutes. And I thought, that's strange. That's very different to anything that I've seen previously. It wasn't a reflection, it was an emission of light. And I thought, well, better have a look at this. And that's when I picked up my binoculars that I always carry. It was a, a definite shape 
pointed at each end, about 15 to 1 ratio. Uh, brilliant yellow and a dark band about two thirds away along from left to right. Don't forget I'm looking at it through between 7 and 10 times magnification to, to normal eyesight. I can see exactly very quickly and quite plainly that it was uh, nothing like an aeroplane that I'd ever seen before. I actually had to take my glasses off and lift them up just to make sure it wasn't a reflection from behind or something like that, um, just to ensure that I was seeing what I was seeing. By now, the other passengers in the plane were aware that something unusual was going on. He uh, sort of leant forward, looked over the nose of the aircraft, and when he, but the pilot does that, you take notice. Kate and John Russell fly regularly between their home in Alderney and the mainland. I thought, okay, there's something unusual going on here. Kate then drew my attention to what was going on. Then he got out his binoculars and stared out through the windscreen at that. Never happened before. I didn't want them to get scared or, or frightened, you know. It's, we're on a professional outfit, you don't want them to be worried about anything really. However, uh, I didn't want to turn back. Ray Bowyer's immediate thought was to radio air traffic control in Jersey. The controller guiding the plane into Alderney was Paul Kelly. On that flight, there's very little to communicate to Ray. It's not normal to su for someone to suddenly start up a conversation on the RT. This is the actual air traffic control recording of the flight. 12 o'clock um, for the next. Roger, I've got a very bright object, uh, so it's uh, how far, extremely bright. Uh, do you have any traffic? I uh, can't really say how far, but by 12 o'clock uh, level. He was reasonably calm, albeit I could, I could detect he was uh, a bit uncertain about something. Uh, no known traffic at all in your 12 o'clock. Whilst air traffic control were trying to locate the sighting, Ray Bowyer was more concerned with avoiding a potential collision. By now he'd been heading towards what he believed was a solid object for almost four minutes. My emotions at that time was simply, uh, what is it? Is it coming towards me? or us in the aeroplane, uh, what's it up to? In April 2007, Captain Ray Bowyer was 4,000 feet above the English Channel, flying towards the island of Alderney, when he spotted a strange light in the sky directly ahead of him. I thought, well, was it coming towards us? What speed's it doing? Is it going to be in our way in a few moments? He immediately spoke to air traffic controller Paul Kelly. Roger, I've got a very bright object. Uh, well, so it doesn't say how far, extremely bright. Looking, well, like a cigar. It's a classic cliche, a cigar shaped object in the sky. It's what you hear about in reports over the years. So immediately, it was very out of the ordinary. He seemed very sure. Um, I was looking for something on my radar that fitted the bill. That may or may not be an object. It was now 10 minutes since Ray Bowyer had first noticed the object. Neither he nor air traffic control had any idea what it could be. I think I was more concerned initially about any conflict. Was it an aeroplane? Even with 20 years of flying experience to his name, Ray Bowyer wasn't sure he could believe what he was seeing. For a second opinion, he turned to the passenger sitting behind him. I suggested to him, would, would you like to have a look and see what you can see? And straight away he said, yeah, I can see this. And about that time, uh, he said, there's another one. Sure enough, almost directly beyond that one was uh, a very similar looking object. People are further down the fuselage uh, were looking out to see what we were looking at. I sort of leant forward to look round uh, the people in front and saw a orange lozenge-shaped light. 
It was at that point, when he had tipped the nose of the plane down, that I noticed two very, very bright lights. I didn't see any outline to the shape because the light was so bright. You know, if you look at a, a headlight at night, you, you don't see the edges of the light. You just see the center of the light and then a diffused glow. Yeah, the second one appears to be beyond the first from where I am. Uh, it's exactly the same. It's got a gap. It's a cylindrical object, very bright yellow, and there's a, a gap in the light about two-thirds of the way along it. I gave the, the air traffic controller that it was probably the size of a Boeing 737 thinking that it was about five or ten miles away but it would have appeared that from first sighting it was about 55 miles away so that must have given it uh, a massive size really very very large indeed and with that that possibility of it being up to perhaps a mile across you've got to worry for the safety of an, aer an airplane which is the size of a poster stamp in comparison you know Despite what Ray Bowyer and his passengers said they were seeing, air traffic controller Paul Kelly could see no evidence of anything in the air. Uh, 544, uh, negative, uh, nothing at all in your 12 o'clock um, for the next 40 miles or so. There was nothing I could determine on the radar that, that, that was unusual. Air traffic initially were fairly dismissive, but of course uh, the, my sightings were dead ahead. There's definitely something there. The objects you were describing were very bright, quite large, and you'd think very obvious. So you would think that other pilots, perhaps in the area, would be able to see the objects. Although Paul Kelly could see nothing on his radar, Ray Bowyer was still convinced that what he was seeing was a solid object. Kelly radioed the other aircraft under his control, asking if anyone could see the unidentified object. We've got something about 8 o'clock resembling the description. Around about the similar range to Albany from us now. The moment when another pilot said he could see something in the vicinity of Alderney, it really um, it did make it much more interesting. A call came in from a pilot corroborating the sighting. The objects had now been in sight for nearly 12 minutes. Ray Bowyer was concerned about getting his passengers onto the ground safely. O-line 544, Roger, would you like to send? Please, I better have to go down on me. It was getting to that point where I was pleased to descend and, and get on the ground. Despite the mysterious encounter, flight GR554 landed on time and on schedule at Alderney Airport. When we landed, Ray turned around and said that he had seen something extraordinary, something he hadn't seen in his 20 years or so of flying and he was quite obviously uh, disturbed by the experience. The girl there who works as a crewing, Lucia, she said, uh, you look like you've seen a ghost, you look pale. I said, well, I'm not sure if it's a ghost or not, but it was certainly something odd. At Jersey Air Traffic Control, Paul Kelly followed the standard procedures for reporting the incident. I had taken down notes as I was going along and uh, a sketch drawing, as Ray had described it. And I asked him to, to fax me his sheet from his flight. In the back of the manual air, air traffic services, there's a section tucked away on reporting unidentified flying objects. It's all quite strange. You phone up the phone number, which is the MOD, and you get an answer machine. Paul Kelly faxed his report to the MOD and awaited developments. In the days following the incident, word spread quickly through the Channel Islands. Local Guernsey journalist Joel de Wolfson first heard the story from a contact in Alderney. He followed his lead and got in touch with Ray Bowyer. I got the feeling that Ray was worried initially about it being, you know, 
weenie pilots as little green aliens are coming to visit Guernsey and damage his reputation because of it. But the headlines took both Ray Boyer and the sighting seriously. Ray is a very honest, straight down the line kind of, kind of guy. The MOD were investigating it, so it added weight to the story straight away. The story was soon taken up by the national media. If you had to take an instinctive guess, would you say that it was something of this planet or something from outer space? I have been asked a question by the press, and my simple answer was, uh, I don't think it's from around here. Extraordinary. Well, this, this object looks like a CD disc on edge, if you like, uh, yeah. but very sharp and extremely well defined. Well, thank you very thank much you for coming in well. and describing it to us. That's very fascinating. Well. Thank you. Thank you. Well. The circumstances surrounding the case caught the attention of UFO investigator Dr. David Clark. In the last 20 years, he's studied over 500 UFO cases from the British Isles. It stood out from the usual reports that are received on a weekly basis of people seeing lights in the sky. It's not very often that UFOs make the news, but in this particular case, you know, the news media realised that there was something unusual about this. David Clark was keen to investigate the incident. There was hundreds of invites to say, can we investigate your case? And We'd like to have a look at this, can we? And I waited and waited until the right team came along, really. And I didn't really want uh, a team of believers, because they are only trying to prove the point. Uh, I wanted a team of skeptics. He's a good witness. He's probably the best witness that I've interviewed in 30 years. There's very little speculation. He's never added further details to his description. He's been very, very consistent in, in what he's described. Putting UFOs aside, David Clark and his team considered a number of other possible explanations for the sighting. The UFO phenomena includes lots and lots of different unconnected things, you know, um, natural phenomena, inexplicable phenomena. There's no definitive connection between any of them other than the fact that they're all things that are seen in the sky. So there is no one UFO phenomena. There are lots of UFO phenomena. One of the more straightforward explanations for supposed UFO sightings is the weather and the effect of unusual atmospheric conditions. One of the leading experts in the field is Dr. Grant Allen of Manchester University. The atmosphere can play all sorts of tricks with light, especially light from the sun. Uh, anybody that's ever come into land over an airport might have noticed below them rainbows, dances of light on the tops of the clouds, shadows. I think because they were described as sunlight yellow, uh, that gives, sort of gives the game away that it's some sort of reflection of sunlight. Dr. Allen created a computer model of the prevailing weather conditions over the Channel Islands at the time of the incident. His model indicated an unusual meteorological anomaly, a temperature inversion, where bands of hot and cold air switch places to create an effect which causes the sun to appear as a narrow band of light. Even for Captain Bowyer, who might have had years of experience and many flight hours, uh, the range of atmospheric conditions could be such that uh, he just wouldn't have recognised this optical phenomenon in this case. I'm sure some of the sightings are likely meteorological phenomena, but I was actually seeing something which was tangible and physical, um, and not a reflected light, not some sort of uh, atmospheric effect. If what Ray Bowyer saw over the English Channel wasn't a natural phenomenon, then what was it? Five four four, any more information on the aircraft, please? Uh, five four four, uh, negative. This is the primary contact that we sometimes get. Pilot Troy Queripel knows the skies over the Channel Islands well. With 15 years' experience of flying in the region, he has his own theory as to the cause of the mysterious lights. After overhearing the conversations with air traffic control. He met Ray Bowyer when he returned to Southampton. Ray convinced me that what he'd seen was real. It was hardware. It wasn't weather phenomenon. He'd never seen anything like it before. My theory was that it could be military activity. About 15 miles to the west of Guernsey, there's military uh, controlled danger zones. These zones are restricted airspace and can only be entered with the express permission of the Ministry of Defence. 
Nick Pope worked on the MOD's UFO desk for three years. The UK air defence region, uh, which goes out in some cases for hundreds of miles into the uh, seas surrounding Britain, contains a number of areas where uh, military exercises take place. You'll also, in some of these areas, see more exotic things going on in terms of the testing of prototype aircraft and unmanned aerial vehicles. There are things flying around, maybe not operational, but certainly in prototype stage, that you won't see for 10 or even 15 years. A very good example is the stealth fighter. Uh, this was publicly declared in 1988 during the Panama campaign to oust General Noriega. Uh, now, it's a matter of record now that, of course, the, uh, the stealth fighter had been uh, operational and uh, before that had been flying in prototype sense for, for many, many years, probably even back in the 70s. Could a military test aircraft have been responsible for Ray Bowyer's sighting? As part of his investigation, David Clark followed up all the leads that might explain the Alderney sighting. He contacted the Ministry of Defence and obtained a copy of their report on the case. In this particular case, we were able to uh, eliminate military activity pretty early on. The Ministry of Defence said on the record that there were no military exercises taking place. For Ray Boyer, it confirmed his own theory as to what he'd seen. I believe it was nothing like uh, any aeroplane. I've seen some uh, strange uh, sort of development type aircraft uh, over the years. The flying wing, uh, the Vulcan type aeroplane, uh, various German experimental aircraft, but nothing, nothing like this, nothing that emitted a brilliant yellow light. And it wasn't a reflection, it was an emission of light. As it transpired, the sighting over Alderney was not an isolated incident. Builder Paul Godian claimed to have witnessed a similar phenomenon on the island seven weeks earlier. I thought, wow, this is within a fairly short space of time, somebody else has actually seen something up there. It just seemed all too real, very real. Paul Godian was alone on the northern tip of the island just before dawn. I like the walk in the morning. It's a nice part of the island, and I do that every day. I saw two lights start to appear under the cloud base, just directly ahead of me. I presumed they were coming towards me. They were sort of bobbing in and out of the cloud base at what I'd presume to be about three or four hundred feet. This seems strange as the only aircraft at about half six in the morning would be the paper plane going over to Guernsey and at that height in misty weather it just didn't seem as if it would be feasible for it to do so. But then the set of lights did something completely unexpected. The one on the left darted at a really high speed towards the left, the west. I panned around to follow the line of sight and all of a sudden, between myself and the two forts, appeared 20, 25 maybe, lights of the same size, bright white lights, in a sort of broken arrowhead shape, broken dart shape. They were moving ho horizontally along the sky line below the cloud base, south towards Guernsey. And there was no noise absolutely no noise from any of it at all. I, 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 I didn't know what to think. I really didn't know what to think. I just thought, I'd, that is really strange. After two seemingly inexplicable sightings in less than two months, was there something about the island of Alderney itself that could provide the answer? On April the 23rd, 2007, two bright lights were reported in the sky above the Channel Island of Alderney. 
They were witnessed by airline pilot Ray Bowyer and his passengers. I thought, what is it? Is it coming towards me or us in the aeroplane? Um, what's it up to? Just seven weeks earlier, Paul Godian also claimed to have seen strange lights floating above the island. It just seemed all too real. Very real. If these sightings did have a rational explanation, one theory was that they were Earth lights. A natural phenomena caused by movement of the Earth's tectonic plates, Earth lights are often seen in the sky before an earthquake. Geologist Professor Peter Salmond has studied them in detail. Earth lights can have many forms, and, and certainly seeing a, a pair of lights looking like a low-flying aircraft could easily have been Earth lights. They hover close to the ground and bathe the air in this sort of, sort of mysterious sort of glow. The island of Alderney does lie on a geological fault line known as the Alderney Ushant Fault. Could this have been the cause of the mysterious lights in the sky? Four days after Ray Bowyer's sighting, seemingly compelling evidence for this theory presented itself. The Kent coastline suffered the largest earthquake in the region for 50 years. During the build-up to the earthquake, the tremors would have been large enough to reach the Alderney fault lines, with a force sufficient to create the lights in the sky. But one thing makes the theory unlikely to explain the events of April the 23rd. We wouldn't expect to see Earth lights with a large body of water present. Our understanding is you need to have a discharge from uh, the Earth through an earthquake fault um, into the atmosphere. Whatever the explanation, Ray Bowyer isn't the only airline pilot to have witnessed strange lights in the sky. Since World War II, there have been thousands of sightings of unidentified flying objects recorded by pilots. Some of the crew and passengers of a BOAC Stratocruiser reported seeing mysterious objects in the sky over the Atlantic. In 1954, Captain James Howard, on a flight from New York to London, claimed to have seen something resembling a flying saucer. Well, very conveniently, Captain, we've got a nice blackboard here. Of this object was continually changing. Sometimes one end would appear to disappear. Sometimes this was very much larger. Sometimes it was almost a V-shaped affair, like this. And I think there's no question that it was no illusion and that it was being intelligently handled. UFO historian Tim Good has compiled hundreds of declassified eyewitness accounts from pilots. In the United Kingdom, sightings tended to increase from about 1950 onwards, I would say, and that's what, there were many reports from pilots beginning around that period. I would say it peaked in 1952, and Winston Churchill, Prime Minister of, of Britain at the time, demanded of his air staff what the hell was going on. He said, what's all this stuff about flying saucers amount to? What's the truth? And in a few weeks, they came back to him and said, Prime Minister, don't worry, it's all been dealt with. We've been in touch with our American counterparts in intelligence, and um, all the unexplained sightings have been explained, and there's nothing to it at all. The response of Churchill's air staff was designed to end investigations into UFOs. But despite official denial that such objects existed, sightings by pilots continued. In October 1954, Flight Lieutenant James Salandin was flying a Gloucester Meteor out of RAF North Weald in Essex. I was flying at about 16,000 feet at the time, and suddenly I saw three what I thought were aeroplanes come down. And when they were, uh, must have been about eight or 900 yards away, the first two peeled off to the left. A gold spherical object and a silver one with buns on top and bun below 
No flames, no portals, no nothing. I have never seen any aircraft produced by anybody in the world that looked anything like these things. Whatever Salandin saw, the objects then moved closer. And then the third one was coming straight towards me. I suppose he probably be about three to four hundred yards away, so it's quite a clear picture. Couldn't have been anything else. And when he got to that distance, he went off to the same to follow his two buddies. I tried to follow after the third one, but it was impossible. The thing was so quick. The closing speed between us was about 900 to 1,000 miles an hour. I shall remember it to my dying day. Um, what they were, I don't know. Where they came from, I don't know. But I definitely saw them. Uh, I was an experienced pilot at the time. Experienced pilots have been seeing objects in the sky for over 50 years. But could the explanation for their sightings be more psychological than physical? Professor Richard Wiseman has studied the phenomenon. If you are up there in the sky and you're traveling very, very fast and you see something in the distance, well, you have to make a snap decision about it. You've got to size it. Its size, uh, the, the direction it's traveling, exactly what it is, and so on. And that has to be done in the blink of an eye. If they do see something anomalous, they've got no kind of category to put that into. They're trying to work out what it is they're actually perceiving there. I think they're sincere in their testimony. I think they're trying to tell us, best they can, what they think they saw. The question is one of accuracy, not of honesty. But what of Ray Bowyer's experience above Alderney in April 2007? The lights he saw in front of his plane for a period of some 12 minutes were also witnessed by several of his passengers. He probably saw it for something like a quarter of an hour. We probably saw it for a matter of minutes. But the size was almost impossible to say. It wasn't a clearly defined edge to it. So you have no real idea as to where the centre core is and how much you're actually seeing. When UFO investigator David Clark examined air traffic control recordings of the flight, he found a reference to an object which could be seen clearly on the radar. Yeah, there is something possibly your left uh, at 10 o'clock at a range of three miles this time. I've got a definite contact by 12 o'clock. Could this object have been what was seen from the cockpit of the plane? You can hear the, in, the inflections in Ray's voice when he's speaking to the controller that he's some, seen something really, really unusual. You know, you, you, there's no hoax here. I think they're possibly over, maybe to the west of Alderney. Roger. Um, I do have a primary contact, just one blob, if you like, uh, eight miles or so to the west of Alderney. We were initially intrigued about this um, suggestion that something had been seen on radar because in the initial conversation between um, Paul Kelly, the air traffic controller, and Ray, um, he does mention at one point that he could see something on radar, but he thought it was a, a anaprop. Anaprop is something normally ignored by air traffic controllers. It's caused by radar signals bouncing off solid objects, such as flocks of birds or even large waves. David Clark was convinced that there might be something in the fleeting anaprop image, if only it could be seen clearly. The radar information he had to examine was filled with the traces of the 600 flights a day that travel in and out of the Channel Islands. If you look at the raw radar data, what you see is a screen that's absolutely filled with moving dots and colours and shapes. And, you know, you really have to know what you're looking at in order to be able to determine whether there is something on there of significance. Jersey Air Traffic Control Engineering Department began the job of examining the radar recordings to see if they could find any clues to what lay underneath. For once, it seemed here was the opportunity that we, we may be able to get something definitively solid um, in, in terms of a radar trace of something that had been reported visually. And, and that really, science would have to sit up and take notice if we had some kind of evidence of that kind. David Clark now had concrete radar evidence with which to analyse whether the Alderney incident was really as mysterious as it appeared. 
But not all sightings of UFOs are as well documented. Some cases are still shrouded in official secrecy. On April the 21st, 1971, Wing Commander Alan Turner was supervising air traffic controller at RAF Sopley in Hampshire. He's never spoken publicly about his experience before. I was sitting at the desk, uh, just twiddling the thumbs. All of a sudden, the coordinator said, what is that? To the east of Salisbury Plain were, at that point, two radar returns. We'll call them, they're called blips. They were traveling in a southeasterly direction, and uh, a third appeared, a fourth appeared, a fifth, a sixth appeared, all from the same spot. Very, very unusual indeed. What is this? It, it doesn't obey any of the known rules. Turner examined the blips on his screen and concluded that the only thing that could have been moving at that speed was the most advanced fighter of the day, the Lightning. But the sheer number of aircraft indicated was simply unbelievable. It was so unusual, people just looked at it and said, what is going on? We're talking 30, 35 aircraft. No air defense commander in his right mind would get the entire Lightning Force at one location. He'd have absolutely nothing left with which to defend the United Kingdom air defense region. You could cut the air with a knife. It became electric rapidly. People were more than surprised. Alan Turner decided to dispatch an RAF bomber to investigate. I kept asking the pilot, are you visual? And then he said, the voice sounded quite jittery, I don't know what that was. It was a quarter of a mile away, climbing like the clappers, and I saw it, we saw it on radar. We did not see it visually. And the radar within the plane was not the only one that picked up this event. There were seven technically different radars, all seeing exactly the same thing. Two radars at Southern Radar, two radars at Heathrow, two at the fighter control establishment, and the airborne one with the Canberra bomber. Alan Turner gathered together all the physical evidence that was being recorded during the incident. There are two types of tape. One is the videotape taken from the radar, and the other is the voice tape. Um, and that is air to ground, ground to air. That is all landlines and all the conversations between the controllers and each other. I have absolutely no idea where it is or even if it uh, still exists. All I do know is that it did exist. Um, I am absolutely certain that there was some very strange phenomenon on radar which no one has yet come up with any rational explanation for. Over 30 years later, the evidence of Alan Turner's encounter has still to be released into the public domain. I think the, the policy behind this was they were baffled, they didn't know what these UFOs were, and they didn't want that fact emerging in public that they couldn't explain what was going on. Whilst evidence of military UFO encounters is rarely available for public scrutiny, Ray Bowyer's sighting over Alderney was different. Engineers at Jersey Air Traffic Control had access to their original radar records. They isolated the 12-minute period in which Ray Bowyer claimed to have seen objects in the sky in front of him, then stripped away the tracks produced by identifiable aircraft. Two distinct traces emerged from the data. What they revealed were the tracks of two unidentified objects, one heading north and one south. It looks to me like very likely that the positions of the, uh, the objects that I saw were in the right place for the radar returns that I've received. Were these traces really proof that two UFOs had been witnessed flying in the skies over Alderney? Yeah, the second one appears to be beyond the first from where I am. In April 2007, pilot Ray Bowyer witnessed two unidentified objects over the Channel Islands. It was a, a definite shape. Uh, pointed at each end, about 15 to 1 ratio, a uh, brilliant yellow and a dark band about two-thirds away along from left to right. I think it's 
think they're possibly over maybe to the west of Albany. Roger. Um, I do have a UFO investigator David Clark studied the available documentary evidence. Like, uh, eight miles or so to the west of paying particular attention to the data provided by air traffic control. Possibly be the second one furthest out that I can see. You really have to know what you're looking at in order to be able to determine whether there is something on there of significance. And a lot of the, um, of, of the, um, the returns on that screen can be eliminated. When engineers stripped away identifiable air traffic, radar revealed two slow-moving objects which seemed to fit the paths of the mysterious lights seen by Ray Bowyer. Now Ray, when he saw those returns, initially made a connection that possibly that was the UFO he'd seen. They would appear to be in exactly the right position at the right time. They both appeared for about 55 minutes at one point, travelled in different directions away from each other and then both appeared to disappear after 55 minutes. But David Clark was not convinced. He felt the traces could have been caused by radar bouncing off objects on the sea below so he studied the schedules for the passenger ferries that moved between the islands. We know from reconstructing the, um, the route taken by the ferry that it would have been in that general area at precisely that time, or certainly around that time. So I think it's far more likely that, that, that one of those prominent tracks is a ferry. With a seemingly rational explanation for at least one of the radar images, this line of inquiry was closed. There was now no physical evidence to back up the sightings of Ray Bowyer and his passengers in April 2007. The final report by Dr. David Clark and his investigation team could reach no definitive conclusion as to the real explanation for what appeared in the sky over Alderney. I think it's much more accurate to describe what he saw as a UAP, an unidentified aerial phenomena, some kind of um, natural phenomena that's yet to be identified and categorised by scientists. Whatever caused the lights over Alderney, Ray Bowyer and his passengers still stand by what they saw on April the 23rd, 2007. I was a bit disappointed that they hadn't found a solution, because it now hangs in the air with all the other hundreds of cases. It isn't until later on you realise that somebody like Ray is regarding it as something quite out of the ordinary that you begin to wish that you paid more attention. I hope we live long enough to know the explanation. I have to confess now, every time we get in a plane, I keep wondering, you know, are we going to see the lights? <laughs> as for Captain Ray Bowyer, he wasn't the first pilot to spot something unexplained in British airspace and it's unlikely he'll be the last. I kept asking the pilot, are you visual? He sounded shaken. There was clearly something which he did not understand and couldn't explain any more than we could. The description I've given you was quite true. I shall remember it to my dying day. If it was designed by an engineer, uh, that man, I'd like to shake him by the hand because it was a fantastic piece of equipment. If that's what it was. I can't really go much further uh, than to say what I've said all along is that this thing's not from around here. A highly emotional documentary next as a 17-year-old is pronounced brain dead. The organ transplant coordinator sets the wheels in motion to fulfil young man's wishes to be a donor in Lifesavers. Thank you.